Double A, you sly bastard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, our next performer up here tonight wants me to assure all of you he is a respected painter, a devoted husband, a doting father of three boys, and he is doing his darndest to give up this sordid life of theater, but he's finding it very difficult. But he promises that tonight is the very last night until tomorrow. <laughs> With his story, The Importance of Being Obnoxious, everyone give it up for Mr. Aaron Scher. I made my first resolution on an overnight flight to London. I was 19. There was a group of drunken American college students who seemed to think that we were in a mobile frat house. <laughs> so by morning, I was exhausted. I was full of hate. And I vowed to never be the obnoxious American. Not me, not ever. <laughs> Foreigners would look at me and they would say, you're different somehow. <laughs> Better than the other Americans. <laughs> and I would say, yes I am. <laughs> and this seemed like a good plan, a good resolution. That is, until I ended up naked in bed with an Italian nightclub owner. <laughs> Then I began to rethink my strategy. <laughs> I, I'm getting ahead of myself, though, so uh, back up a little bit. His name was Lucas. <laughs> I met him on a train in Italy. I, I don't know what it is about trains in Italy. <laughs> Um, sorted men. Um, seems to be a theme tonight, but yes, I met Lucas on a train in Italy, probably near where she met her man. Um, and, uh, and we hit it off immediately. We talked art. I was an art major, so art was all I ever wanted to talk about. And he knew more than I did, so it was perfect. Uh, and after a while, he, he told me that he was going to spend the night at a friend of his uh, who lived outside of Venice and would I like to join him? And I enthusiastically said yes. Because that's what travel's all about. You meet new people, you have new adventures, you change directions, and this seemed like a great, a great thing. I was not prepared for the sheer opulence of his friend's home, the, 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 the exquisite beauty. I mean, this place, it had a gate. I mean, like a real gate, not like a gated community gate, but a real gate, and it had grounds. And, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting at a table, and there was a servant standing behind me. And he was, he was putting out plates of beautiful Italian food and, and a bottle of beautiful Italian wine. I mean, it was from a bottle. <laughs> Up to that point, I could only afford to drink wine out of a carton. <laughs> so this was, I was dazzled, absolutely dazzled by this spread and the home and everything. So after, after dinner and another glass of wine, we retired to the stable house. Notice I say retired. Because that's the sort of thing you do when you are in a place like this. You retire to the stable. <laughs> and that's where things got a little bit weird. <laughs> it wasn't so much the sauna that, that set off the alarms for me. I mean, we went to the sauna, and yes, we were both naked. But, I mean, this is Europe. I mean, they're much more, you know, at peace with their bodies. They're okay with that. And I didn't want to be, you know, the repressed American. <laughs> so, you know, naked in the sauna. It wasn't that. It was, it was not until we got to the bedroom that I really started to worry. You see, I thought it was going to be my bedroom. And so I climbed in bed. And then Lucas came in. And he climbed in bed. And we were both naked in bed. But I didn't want to say anything because I wanted to be the obnoxious Americans. <laughs> so he flips off the bedside light, and I turn over on my right side so as my that my mechanics would face away from him. <laughs> 
with my clothes. And beyond that is the door. So I'm starting to think, OK, can I make it to the pack? And should I put my clothes? No, I shouldn't put my clothes on there. He might wake up. So should I just grab my pack and go out onto the grounds naked? Uh, but, but there's grounds. And, and then remember, there's a gate. And there's probably security, maybe even a dog. Should I climb the gate naked? Oh. <laughs> so I finally calm down at my wild scheme. I calm down, I breathed a little, and then I, I padded along the wall, and I found a door. So I opened the door, and I walked in, and there was a bathroom. I turned on the lights, closed the door, and I stood there trying to figure out what to do, and I stood there looking in the mirror thinking, what has happened? <laughs> And then I noticed in the reflection that there was another door behind me. And so I turned around and I, I very quietly opened that door and I realized there was another bedroom. There had been another bedroom this whole time with an, another bed. <laughs> Lucas didn't tell me. So I, I snuck to the other bed and I climbed in and I sat there and I, I stared at the ceiling and I started to think like, what does that even mean? I like to sleep like little at times. <laughs> I still am not quite sure what I'm I haven't even been a boy scout. I don't even know how they sleep together. But I'm an Italian boy. So eventually, I drifted off to sleep. And then in the morning, all Lucas said about the whole evening was, I did not know where you were. <laughs> and that was it. So that is when my, my resolution started to crumble. But it took almost another year before I entirely ditched it. It took a good play, I mean a good woman and a very bad play for me to totally ditch the thing. And that good woman is Linnell, who is in the audience tonight. I can't see her, but I can feel her starting to blush. <laughs> She's probably giving me that look. Stop. She's really good at that one. Anyway, so... <laughs> Linnell came to visit me. I, I was living abroad for two years. I was studying in Scotland. And she came to visit me in the last three weeks of my time abroad. And, uh, and in the course of that three weeks, I went from not even being sure that we would be a couple to asking her to marry me. It turns out I'm, I'm not gay, I'm just creative. <laughs> because I fell madly in love with her. And uh, so we had this three-week whirlwind romance, and at the end of that three weeks, we went down to London, and I was so excited. I'd taken many trips down to London, and I'd seen such incredible theater in London. And back then, you could, you could get in line, and you could get standby tickets. You'd get in line about an hour before a show, and if it wasn't sold out, you could get tickets for 10 quid, any show. I saw Judy Dench, two-person play, and she never left the stage, and stuff like that. I, I cried many tears <laughs> at many shows in London. Uh, so much so that often I would have to wait until everybody left because I was too embarrassed. <laughs> so, for some reason on this trip, we couldn't find a play. We couldn't find anything. It was nothing. Finally, I, I found a play, an obscure play, new playwright. It was a theater on the fringes of London. And, uh, and it had gotten good reviews, you know, some edgy new play. And, uh, and we get there, and it's this, and we had to pay full price. And it's this little theater, it's even smaller than this one. And, uh, and we sit down, we realize this play, it's basically like the playwright had seen a couple of Edward Albee plays and thought, I could be creepier. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was like watching him jack off at your expense. It was horrible. <laughs> and within, you know, at the first blackout, we just, we bolted. We were out of there. We just looked at each other and went, yeah, let's go. And we snuck out as quietly as we could. And I'm thinking, God, 
you know, I was so crushed because I was so excited to, to show her some good theater in London. And we had paid full price. It was 50 quid between the two of us. So we had lost all that money. And I, and I said something about losing the money and how disappointed I was. And she looks at me and she says, we didn't lose any money. I said, what do you mean? We, we paid 50 pounds. They have the money. We don't have the money. <laughs> but part of that am I missing? She said, no. Get her money. And she just looks at me and she smiles and she says, watch. <laughs> so she walks across the lobby and there's this poor unsuspecting Londoner sitting behind the desk. And she leans over and she says, excuse me, I'm sorry, but that play was terribly written. It was offensive, and we need our money back. And I'm standing back there, and I'm ready to run. <laughs> like, because, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be the obnoxious American. <laughs> and she's just asked for a refund. And the person on the other side of the desk is equally flustered. I don't think this has ever happened to him. Because <laughs> he's tripping over himself with excuses, and he can't get a sentence out. And he finally says, but you were in there for a long time. <laughs> and Linnell says, yeah, we wanted, we, we got out at the first blackout. We didn't want to be rude. We didn't want to disrupt the play. And so then he tried that other excuse. I don't have the authority to issue refunds. But he said it in that way. I don't have the authority to issue refunds. <laughs> and to me, like, he used that word issue. Like, he didn't say issue, he issue. That has authority. I'm like, like, okay, you know? <laughs> yeah. We better go, man. Because clearly we can't get our money back, right? She said, well, then who does? Uh, I have to speak to the manager. Well, speak to the manager. Well, she's not here. And Linnell points at the desk and she says, that thing right there, that's a phone. Call her. <laughs> looking at it. And uh, he finally gets on the phone and then he says, well, he, he you know, kind of puts his hand there and says, it, it'll be a while. And then he, he hangs up the phone and Linnell, she, she goes and she sits on the desk. <laughs> she leans her hand out and she says, that's okay, we've got all night. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> and it was at that, up until that point, I was ready to melt in the floor. I wanted to die. This was not <laughs> never to but when she sat on the desk and she leaned across and she said, I was so turned on. <laughs> I had never seen something so sexy in my whole life. You know, and I thought I knew this woman. I had proposed to her. Like, I was going to marry her. But in that moment, I realized she was dangerous. <laughs> And that is something altogether entirely different. <laughs> and that's when I realized what love truly is, that, that she is something more than me, something beyond my understanding. And it wasn't until, a few, until, until years later that she really explained what it was that she was about that night. She was talking to a friend that she was having some issues with, and she said to him, Look, I'm not nice. I'm kind. There's a difference. <laughs> and when I think back to that crazy night with Lucas, I was putting so much energy in trying to be nice, to trying not to offend, that I didn't give him the courtesy of being kind and telling him how I really felt. And so, at that moment, I made a new resolution. 
It's a simple resolution. It's a resolution that I will continue to strive for and probably will never attain, and that's to be more like my wife. 